Hi, good morning, and welcome to the Keys History and Discovery Center on our, our segment Discover History here at the Keys, uh, here at the museum. I'm curator Brad Bertelli, and I'll be uh, talking a little bit about early farming practices in the Upper Keys. Again, if you have any questions while I'm talking live, uh, be sure and type them in. Aaron is manning the, uh, the Facebook page, so we can be sure and answer your questions on, on air. Otherwise, I will get to them later back at the office. Um, so today, we're going to talk, uh, when you think about the Florida Keys, you don't normally think farming. It doesn't, you, you come here in the modern day and you think fishing, you're thinking diving, you're thinking nice frosty cocktails and sunsets, but what you don't think of is farming. And in reality, in the early, in, in the early pioneer years, and even through the 1950s and 1960s, farming was still a pretty large, uh, a pretty large and important uh, aspect of life here in the Florida Keys. Um, in, the, in, the, in the pioneer years, in the early years, with these, these early families who were settling on, uh, on the Keys, um, they were all, you know, there, there was you know, really two kinds of farming going on. There was subsidy farming, where they were trying to raise crops you know, for their, their own selves and, and for their families and their neighbors. And then also you know, cash crops, you know, selling to you know, farming for, as a means of income, as a means of, of selling their their produce to markets. And those markets would have been, you know, Key West, uh, and from Key West, those fruits and vegetables would have been shipped to, uh, you know, uh, East Coast markets, you know, Boston and Philadelphia and New York and, and um, I want to say Maryland, but uh, Maryland is, is not a city, it's a state, and I can't think of the, of the Baltimore is the word I'm looking for. Um, so th these 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 uh, this produce would be shipped, you know, shipped to these other you know, to, to these markets where there was really a you know it, it was a, it was possible to make a decent living with, with farming. We've talked about Captain Ben Baker uh, on several occasions. He was one of the earliest uh, commercial farmers. He um, uh, developed two uh, pineapple plantations, one on Key Largo, one on Plantation Key. And in the 1870s, he was, you know, he was realizing $7,000 from his cash crops of pineapples, which in today's market would be a six figures. You know, it, it, it was substantial income coming in. Um, but one of the things you, that makes it kind of difficult to fathom the idea of farming in the Upper Keys, if you spent any time here at all or tried to dig a hole in your backyard to plant a bush for your wife or, or, or tree, is how little topsoil there is and how rocky, how rocky the substrate is. The Florida Keys, specifically the Upper Keys, are really built atop an ancient coral reef, and there's not a lot of topsoil. It's really, a, when trees grow and plants grow, their roots really spread out as opposed to, to spreading down. And it's, so you kind of have a hard time kind of realizing, well, how do you plant, how do you plant a row of tomatoes or a row of, of, of melons or pineapples on this, on this rocky topsoil? And what was interesting, and Erin has brought this up uh, with her family, her grandfather, and, and, we've, and, and uh, how they would find places to plant. And we've seen it in other, in other uh, documents from the late 1800s where the, where, where the plan was they would walk with a stick and they would poke the ground looking for places that, that, that had a little, deep, a little deep soil. And they would poke, poke it and then plant the seed and then poke and then plant the seed. So when you think of farming, you don't really think of these long, extravagant rows, these organ Organized rows of, of of plants. Pineapples were a little different because those you know did did, did well in, in the topsoil. But with uh, you know with, with trees and with, and with uh, and with the um, you know the melons and the cucumbers and tomatoes and onions, they weren't really a straight you know there wasn't always the opportunity to straight a, a row of, of of plants. You had to make sure there was you know the top the, the right topsoil. A lot of the early pioneers also talked about these things called, uh, they referred to as red, uh, red holes. And these were depressions in, in the ground that would fill up with uh, dust at, that, that would settle below or from, from the African continent. It would settle, and it would, it would settle in, the, in these depressions and create this, this you know, area of, 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 of deep soil that had very few rocks in it. And one of the, one of the comments from you know, the early pioneers, the early settlers, was they would, would be able to plant there and then not have to weed, or weed, maybe weed once, but there weren't, you know, they wouldn't have to have to you know kind of navigate around all the rocks the soil here in the keys is still very very rocky and it's um you know, so it's it's tough to find a, a, one place to plant a, a seed to have it have it grow into a, a nice plant 
Um, it's you know more difficult to find a, a, a area with, where there's rows of them. Now, although it's kind of difficult after the after the last weekend we've had to think of uh, rain um, historically. The, there was more rainwater in, in, in the Keys, and it, it rained more frequently. It doesn't rain so much anymore, although over the, it still rains a lot, but not with the frequency it once did. Although um, the last couple of days, what's now Hurricane Sally brought torrential. I've never seen it rain for you know, 24 hours straight. Normally it rains you know, for 20 minutes or an hour, and then, you know, then it's gone. But it was torrential for over, you know, for over an hour or for over a day. Which was, uh, which was pretty remarkable. Yeah, we have a question. We do, this is a great question. Tanya would like to know, how did they deal with iguanas? <laughs> well, there were none. So it was very, very easy to deal with iguanas because there were none. The iguanas really uh, were um, a late, late 20th century, or late 20th century, uh, you know, invasive species. Um, they're not indigenous. Iguanas are indigenous to South America. Um, so they didn't, that was not an issue back in the days. I know today I uh, refer to them as the, as the dragons out in the yard where I'm, you know, I'm constantly going out and shooting them out of the garden because they are, they have a tendency to, to find a favorite, a favorite bush these days and knock that one down to the stems. Um, but, 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 but historically, iguanas were never a problem. Um, they had other problems, uh, uh, you know, mice and raccoons and possums and the occasional bear and panthers coming in. Um, so there, there were mosquitoes, you know, if you can imagine trying to farm and you know, especially with pineapple, with pineapple farming, because pineapples, as you know, or may not know, are a bromeliad, and all those leaves collect water and fresh water with the rain, and what does fresh water do? It produces, it gives, it gives the uh, mosquito an opportunity to, to lay its eggs and, and to gestate and to, uh, to, you know, to hatch, whatever. And um, so pineapple fields were especially you know, notorious for having Having all you know mosquitoes and also those um, you know if you try ever you know uh, had tried, uh, grown a pineapple those ends of those spears are very sharp and um, and uh, so it's it was really a, you know a, a difficult a, a difficult thing to manage one of the really interesting stories I read in uh, in, in K in, um, Kay Wilkinson's book, uh, It Had to Be You, she, they, when uh, Tony Thompson, the Thompson family who were from Key West and were the, uh, who, who, who raised, uh, who developed, their father developed Thompson cigars, which are still, you know, still sold today. But they had bought uh, several acres, I think 40 acres of land in Planter, in the Key Largo area. And when Tony moved up from Key West uh, around 1919 area, Ish area, he w would talk about. He would ask questions because his feet were always, his shoes would always get ruined, and, and and the shoes once once they got wet were always ruined. And these guys working in in, in, in the vegetable fields and in the in the crop fields, he you know was trying to figure out how do how do you keep your your shoes from getting ruined. And what they would do is they would take uh, uh, automobile tires and cut the uh, cut the rubber off and use that. For the sole, because that was the only thing that would, would that would help you know, try to uh, deal with the water and also deal with the rocky with the rocky uh, the rocky shore. But um, so farming really kind of went away as the as uh, as convenience of the railroads first came in and were able to bring things, and as the community really went from a farming community to a tourism based in, you know uh, tourism based. A community, which really began in you know with, with the arrival of of Henry Flagler's railroad, as the as the keys began to open up more and fishing, which was really the the big the big deal. You know, in the 1920s and 1930s, these fishing clubs began to you know began to, to become erected, and uh, the stories of, of the great fishing here in the Florida Keys uh, began to spread. Um, and then also there was a series of hurricanes, and you know in, in the in the early 1900s that really eradicated the pineapple industry. It also didn't help that Henry Flagler charged a because of the local market, the, the, the local farmers could not compete with the Cuban farmers because. Henry Flagler charged Cuban farmers a lower tariff than he did the local farmers, so that kind of helped to you know to put aside the uh, the farming industry, and then um, and then with the series of hurricanes came in and the, the storm surge kind of salted the earth and kind of ruined it for pineapples. Um, so and then after pineapples, uh, the, the big cash crop that came through were limes, 
Um, and back in the, you know, originally uh, the lime, the key lime or Mexican lime was not referred to as the key lime or Mexican lime. It was for, you know, originally it was just, you know, the lime tree. So in these early accounts in the early 1900s um, and, and in 1800, late 1800s, early 1900s, you're still referring to, to, you know, lime trees and lime pie and not key lime pie. Key lime became a, a, marketing, a marketing ploy uh, later on, um, uh, 1930s, 1940s, I believe. I, I'm not positive off the top of my head. Um, but it's so, it's, uh, so again, uh, farming, you don't think about it as a, as a thing, you know, in the Florida Keys. Uh, it's, there's still, you know, um, even though the articles back, you know, in, in, in the late 1800s or 1900s talk about how wonderful the soil was for growing tomatoes, the best crops in South Florida, you know, were grown here in, 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 in the Upper Keys and, and the juiciest pineapples. You know, this is before, uh, today Hawaii is a big pineapple, you know, the pineapple uh, uh, growing state, but in those days it was not possible to ship pineapples from Hawaii to the mainland without them all spoiling, so a lot of the pineapples uh, were grown here in South Florida and also the Florida Keys. Um, but Key Lime's after that, and now uh, it's hard to find uh, a, 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 a good Key Lime tree. Um, sadly, when we first moved, first bought our house in 2012, our neighbor across the street, who we had not yet met, um, they, uh, Teresa and David Boris, had a marvelous key lime tree. And, and when we first moved in, we would always come home, there'd be bags of key limes at our front, at our front porch. And we're like, oh great, the key lime fairy stopped by again, you know, yay. And sadly, in, in Irma, their tree, their, their tree had been knocked over and, and displanted or uprooted. And uh, sadly, it's uh, never quite recovered. And our, uh, and our um, key lime fairy is, is not quite as productive as it once was, but I did we do have several plants growing now, hopefully, to repopulate the, the key lime population. Because there's nothing better than fresh key lime pie, those fresh limes on your, on your cocktails, on, on your fish, and your ceviche. Um, but so, another great aspect of Florida Keys history, farming. Who, who knew this, this would be a place to farm? Next Wednesday, next Wednesday we're going to have a, a really great interview with two, um, two locals who uh, who will know a little bit about farming, and, and we'll probably uh, talk about that aspect of of the uh, of, of 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 there a little bit. They might cover that a little bit, especially if you if, if you ask if Erin asks the right if Erin asks the, the question. I think she might now. Um, so tune in next Wednesday for our, the first of our lecture series. Um, the next Monday or next Tuesday we'll be back here talking about more Keys history on Discover Discover history. And in the meantime, uh, the sun's out finally. The uh, Upper Keys and the Florida Keys are starting to dry out, so we're happy about that. And uh, you guys have a great day. Thank you so much.